Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're taking a look at Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. Uh, the, 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 the man himself, the legend, is back on the silver screen, adapting the Broadway musical and, of course, the old feature film. We're excited to talk about our, our, our thoughts around it and whether or not it's worth your time. We're also going to take a look at The Heart of They Fall, a Netflix Western that came out a few weeks back that we didn't have time to cover on the show during this little two week hiatus in which I've been moving. Uh, apologies for the new digs still working on decorating. Uh, we want to take a break and, you know, kind of reset. And now we're back and, and we got a sweet Netflix feature to watch. Uh, we are going to talk about some news. Uh, what is, what is this story for our middle segment? Uh, 101 greatest screenplays of the 21st century. Honestly, a little surprised at some of the top hitters on that. So keep an eye out for that in the middle of our show. And before we get to all of that, we, of course, need to talk about the news. Our first story, Colin Farrell is going to be reprising his role as the Penguin in Batman's spinoff series for HBO Max. This is coming off of the Matt Reeves film, which actually has not come out yet. Uh, but might be putting the, the horse before the cart here, Andy, right? A little premature. Maybe I mean, possibly, think? but I mean, Batman is always a successful franchise. And now the the um, you know, the the thing that's in vogue to do is if you got a hot property, you make a TV series, you know, uh, Marvel or sorry, Disney is doing that with both Marvel and Star Wars properties. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's like a Matrix show eventually. And uh, Peacemaker, I was going to say from uh, Suicide Squad, is going to have a show. And now the, the Penguin himself uh chief of crime in gotham is gonna also have a show yeah uh you're you're right on the money warner brothers is no stranger to this uh they're doing it with peacemaker uh the guardian the guardians of the galaxy director james gunn spinoff series from the suicide squad which he directed uh starring john cena looks to be pretty good solid new trailer out if you haven't seen it by the way uh also i've heard i haven't seen any confirmation on this but from some some articles back in the day i heard they're working on a dune series uh, about the Bene Gesserit sisters uh, following oh, the success right. of Dune. Yeah, that's going to be some kind of prequel to the film. I think that's it's in early production with Denis Villeneuve working on it. So that's exciting. Now they're doing this. Warner Brothers is really continuing to surprise me at how on it they seem to be when it comes to catering to streaming audiences. Like, man, uh, HBO Max is not only a value now, but it seems like it's going to continue being a value well into the next year, even if we're not getting day-in-day -day releases. I'm impressed. Yeah, I was I was reading an article actually earlier this week that uh, HBO Max managed to stay relevant and increase in survivors during the last year in a time when a lot of streaming service, services are starting to really plateau and they have kind of peaked in terms of how many subscribers uh, they're going to get. But because of the day and date releases, that really helped them. And again, things like new, new content, new films, new shows, it's going to really help the platform stay relevant and grow. Yeah, being able to choose where the audience sees their film, whether that be in the comfort of their own home or on the silver screen at a movie theater, is good. I, I think that's that's a pro-consumer practice that 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 gives the consumer options in which to view like view and consume their media. Um, a lot of other companies don't feel that way, and, and a lot of the people working at Warner Brothers did not like this when it initially launched, and I think still don't. But I think it's important, and I think audiences see that, and I think uh, you know people well, are going to continue supporting it. I hope. Well, and it is important to note that it is going away in 2022, but the what it's changed to is going to be a 45-day window. If something comes out in theaters, 45 days later, it's going to be on HBO Max, which apparently used to be like six to eight months before it was showing up on HBO. Um, so that's, that window is shortened by a ton. Yeah, and I mean, that's not too bad considering right now they do have day and date, which is good, but those only stick around for 30 days. If you don't watch that new film within 30 days of it coming out on HBO, it goes away again and you have to wait for it to come back. So wait an extra 45 days? Like that's that's not so bad. That's 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 not bad at all, actually. So, and uh, for what it's worth, this seems like a promising something for the Batman, right? <laughs> which is good because I think that movie looks sick and I'm excited to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Our next story, uh, the Golden Globe nominations are out despite the ongoing boycott. This is following some drama over the last couple of years. I'm going to be honest, Andy, me and maybe a few of our audience members might have forgotten a little bit of why that is. Why are people upset at the Golden Globes again? What, what was their deal? So the LA Times did an expose on the Golden Globes organization, which is the Hollywood Foreign Press, um, into their kind of membership uh where they're just lacking diversity, also financial practices and shady, like basically 
bribe you know uh people they're getting bribed in a way to you know to promote certain shows or nominate certain things and then kind of after that article came out there's a, a huge kind of scandal and fallout and they were dropped from being televised nbc dropped them and no one was willing to pick them up so they have con they have decided to still continue to do the awards but the announcements were, were not televised this year like they normally are and they're still don't they're going to be i guess online um so it's it's kind of a, a sad thing, but they're they're still doing them. They're still going to do it, uh, and they're you know they and the, they we've got the whole spiel that they're committed to change and whatever else, but uh, it's not going to be televised. That's all, all I know. Yeah, well, I'm going to be honest. I'm surprised by some of the picks in here. Uh, I, I I just a quick quick summary. Belfast, uh, Kenneth Branagh's new film, and The Power of the Dog, the Netflix film. Uh, have led the film nominations with seven nominations each at the Golden Globes, while Succession, the HBO show, uh, is leading TV programs with five nods. Uh, I'm surprised at both of these films because I didn't think either of them looks particularly good. I've heard they're great. Uh, Andy actually had a, had, had a come to Jesus moment with me just the other day and was like, you gotta go, we need to watch Belfast. That movie's gonna be cool. I'm like, you're right. It's I gotta look past the black and white, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> classic british new nostalgia way. yeah british film and 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 get off get off my high horse it's probably worth seeing especially considering how many nominations it has anything in here you want to review i mean this is the 79th golden globes i, I, mean, I there's probably a couple categories we're talking about right yeah sure um first of all i don't know what coda is i haven't heard what that film and that's on the best motion picture oh, yeah, what is coda? so i'm not sure what that is uh the power of the dog which i've watched the first act of and i i it was kind of slow i didn't really like it and i just stopped but a bunch of people have told me like you have to finish the film like it gets really good you just have to get through the yeah. first act so i i need to revisit it because apparently it's um uh it's it's really good um a lot of the stuff it is stuff that hasn't really come out yet um being the ricardos uh cyrano don't look up licorice uh pizza uh those those kinds of things um yeah, it's it's a it's a strange mix of like things that you've heard and then some things that like maybe you haven't uh, at all. Right, stuff so, that like was kind of big and bombastic and came to theaters, and others that went straight to streaming services that really did not make much of a splash, but are apparently pretty awesome. Uh, really quick, I looked it up. Codex. I haven't heard of this film either. Uh, it's an Apple TV film. TV Plus. Apple TV Plus is where it's at. Uh, quick summary from IMDb. As a coda or a child of deaf adults, Ruby is the only hearing person in her deaf family. When the family's fishing business is threatened, Ruby finds herself torn between pursuing her love of music by wanting to go to Berkeley and her fear of abandoning her parents. That actually sounds really sweet. I, I've I, not heard of this I feature, think I... Right? I I think I have actually. Now, really? Now that, now yeah. that I've, well, I, I've heard it's good. I've heard it's good. Now that I, I definitely don't have the title. I don't have Apple Plus or Paramount Plus, so I'm 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 kind of yeah. Out on and those, not about but. to start. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll like cash in that 14 day free trial and watch all the Ted Lasso I can in two weeks. Um, I I don't know if there's anything really worth talking more about these. You know, the Golden Globes. Yeah. I mean, the biggest exciting. story is yeah. just that they're still happening despite yeah. having no television platform to, to do right. now and, um, and i don't want to i don't i don't, don't want to get stuck in in nominations you know what we're, we're big on the oscars here we'll talk about these more if anything exciting happens if you want to go check out the golden globe nominations they're available go take a gander our last story before we get into west side story west side stories box <laughs> office is singing off key with a 10.5 million dollar opening weekend that doesn't seem so bad maybe at initial shine but it's worth knowing Steven Spielberg's new feature cost a little over $100 million to make. And the last big musical that came out, uh, In the Heights from Lin-Manuel Miranda, made more money than this. And that movie came out on HBO on the same day. So what's going on, Andy? Why, why, is, uh, why is Steven Spielberg's hot new film not crushing it like we'd expect? So this is a story we've heard several times this year, which is uh, films aimed at older audiences tend to struggle and those audiences just don't come out. Um, it, we saw this with things like uh, The Last Duel and uh, actually House of Gucci is doing OK. But a lot of these older these dramas aimed at older people just aren't really hitting. Uh, they were hoping to get about 10, uh, 15 million, uh, 13 to 15 million this weekend and for West Side Story. So it fell short of that. Uh, by comparison, In the Heights made a little bit more at eleven and a half million, but but again, that came out on HBO Max. That's where our, where we watched it, uh, I believe. So, uh, yeah, it's not a great opening for so, and and it's a shame be, because uh, it is a pretty fantastic movie, which we'll get into more. But it's it's hurting at the box office. 
Yes, a full West Side Story review coming in like T-minus four minutes. I just want to talk about this briefly. Um, my hot take why this movie is not doing well is poor marketing. Um, you know, I only saw a couple trailers for West Side Story, despite the fact that it's kind of been sitting uh, in, the, in, in, in the wings waiting to kind of premiere. Um, they shot this, Spielberg shot this at the same time as in the Heights. Uh, they, they, in fact, they, I, there are stories of them shooting so close to one another in New York that Lynn manuel Miranda and Steven Spielberg would go visit each other's sets on occasion just to kind of, you know, feel each other out and see what's going on. They were literally within blocks of one another. That's how close they were shooting these two musicals. Um, Lynn manuel Miranda's is new and fresh, and it's kind of this newer thing. It's been on Broadway for a little while, but uh, it comes on HBO the same day. West Side Story is like a storied classic from director Steven Spielberg, who is obviously a blockbuster creator. Um, I'm a little surprised it didn't do as well, but I, I really feel like the marketing for In the Heights, I saw like three or four trailers. All of them are really big and bombastic and featured exciting musical numbers, singing and dancing, like the best parts of the film. West Side Story, there's not a lot of singing in that trailer. Like at all. And there's a little bit of dancing, but for the most part, it kind of like hits you with the orchestral score and, and a little bit of the song tonight. And then it's supposed to just kind of wrap you in the emotion of it, like the nostalgia for West Side Story. And I think it just kind of missed. People didn't didn't really pick up on it. People didn't know it was coming out. That's that's the finger I'm pointing at this for marketing. Yeah. What, what I, do you think? Well, I think the marketing was probably fine, but it's I think they were really hoping that just like the familiarity of the property would you know, propel it. It's like, well, everyone knows West Side Story. It's a classic. It'll come out. It's got singing and dancing and all all the, you know, things. But but again, this is something that probably should have come out on on uh, day and date release, but should have been dual, hi, sorry, hybrid released on streaming as well as in theater. It is a great theatrical watch for sure. Right. But it, it would have caught more eyes had it been available to stream. Because again, it and this is unfortunate, but it seems like the only things that, that are getting people to theaters are the big uh, blockbuster tentpole films, uh, Marvel, Star Wars, and and things things like that. Uh, a musical, most people are probably just going to watch it. Want to watch at home? Won't anybody think of the theater, right? Musicals, come on. Um, it's okay. With that, I think it's time we roll into West Side Story proper. Andy's going to be taking the summary on this. So thanks, Andy. I appreciate it. I think, I think, I think Heart of They Fall is <laughs> easier to summarize than this, even though this is older. So Godspeed, uh, Andy. Please take it away. West Side Story. So this is the brand new remake of the 1961 classic film um, based on the 1957 musical of the same name, West Side Story, which uh, is a, a retelling of Romeo and Juliet, of, of all things. It's modernized in takes place in 1950s New York with a rival uh, strip kind of street gangs that are largely based on race you have the white irish gang of the jets and then the puerto rican gang which are the sharks um and you have maria who is a member of the uh she's not a member of the gang but <laughs> she's puerto rican and you have tony played by ansel elgort uh they meet at a dance they fall in love they have this kind of forbidden star-crossed romance um there's tensions there's there's uh you know they, they want to have a big rumble settle who who owns this this land and um you know like i said it's based on, on romeo and juliet so it's a little bit of a tragic ending uh but i really liked it 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 was pretty fantastic amazing just product from a production standpoint like the costumes the singing the dancing some of these performances are incredible they, they got a lot of broadway people for this instead of something like la la land where they taught actors to sing and dance yes who, who did they did okay like emma stone and ryan reynolds not ryan reynolds ryan gosling do it fine but this is like a whole another no level because you you got they got they they got the pros for a lot of this this stuff uh it so it, it's pretty great from a production like it's very entertaining and uh i i, I really liked it. it is it is a little long it's it's full like two two and a half hours um but uh, we'll get into it. Zach, what do you think? So I, I think West Side Story, um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a musical fan and, and I like uh, the original play. I've never actually seen it in person, um, but I've seen lots of clips and bits and, you know, heard from performers uh, who are in it. I, I, I love the original film from 1961. Um, I, I've seen that film a handful of times. So going into this, I, I, I was excited. Right. I was looking forward to not only West Side Story, this thing I love, but also like a new Steven Spielberg feature. We have not seen anything from him in a minute. This is his first musical ever. 
big things are happening on screen, right? And and what I think West Side Story is, the, this adaptation of it, is, is just that. It is an adaptation of the original work, um, almost to a fault. It is, it is so, it, it stays so within the lines, I think, of what West Side Story is and how it works, that people who love the original are going to love this one just as much. But... I, I, it, it's missing a little something from Spielberg. It's it's missing that Spielberg magic. It's just a little bit of that signature something. And I can't put my finger on what that is. I've talked to Andy about it offline. I've watched reviews about it, trying to nail how I feel, and I still can't. West Side Story, I think, is a really, really good musical. But somehow I left the theater just a little disappointed. And I want to talk about why. So um, first, of all, first off, everything that works in this film, which is most of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, let's just start with the music. It's a musical, classic music from uh, L- Leonard Bernstein and uh, Stephen Sondheim, uh, the lyricist who just passed away a few weeks ago, um, who was on set. He was he collaborated with closely with uh, Steven Spielberg. So he was kind of there, you know, uh, the entire time. But just it, it's incredible music. And I, I've had the pleasure of, of or the fortune of having played the, the West Side Story Suite several times uh, throughout my career as a musician. Um, it's just fantastic music. It's iconic. It's it's deeply uh, American and uh, kind of Puerto Rican in influenced. Uh, this the the singers are great. They uh, Ansel Elgort kind of isn't great, but he does have a great voice. Uh, is that I was I can't remember the Rachel yeah, Ziegler. Rachel Zegler. Uh, Z- Zegler? Yeah, I don't. Rachel, <laughs> there is, there's no I in there. Z E G L E. So it could be Zegler. I apologize. You're right. You're right. Rachel Zegler is also good, and probably the standout for me is uh, Ariana Dubose, who plays uh, Anita. Um, she is a Broadway uh, star right now, uh, but she is phenomenal. She has to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Like r- she's got to do the singing. She's got really powerful acting scenes, and she's got these incredible dance numbers. Like the the America section is probably the uh, the best song and dance number in the film, and it's just incredible. And and she and she's amazing. And and as as is uh, David Alvarez, who plays uh, Bernardo, who's like the the head of the the Jets. He also has to do a lot of singing and dancing. Um, really phenomenal. The other thing, there's a lot of Spanish in this film and it's, it's, it's completely unsubtitled and there's a lot of, there's a lot of that uh, you may not understand that I didn't understand, but you understand enough or there will be an English sentence following that kind of brings you up. So I I feel like the language part is a, is a big difference in this film. Yeah. uh, I, I I think all solid points. Um, First off, yes, the, the acting and, and, and presentation, of the actors and actresses in this film is phenomenal from the dance numbers to the singing to the proper actual acting between those numbers. Um, everybody in this movie is very good except in my opinion, Ansel Elgort. I, I, you may have seen on the internet, him catching some flack. He was trending on Twitter over the weekend. Um, cause so many people were seeing this film and hopping on Twitter and saying, Oh my God, Ansel Elgort is killing this film. Um, I don't know if that's true. He's he feels uniquely out of place, uh, but his character Tony is supposed to be a little out of place, right? Tony is a reformed criminal. He's just gotten out of prison. He has returned to the Jets on the West Side. All of his friends, Riff and company, want him to hang out and go rumble. And he's like, nah, man, I'm on parole. I'm on probation. I can't do that. So he's supposed to be a little removed from everybody. But it, it feels like everybody else in this movie, everybody, Rachel, I mean, Rachel Ziegler is Maria, Ariana DeBose is, is David Alvarez is Bernardo, uh, Mike Faced is Riff, um, oh God, what, Rita Moreno is Valentina, and every single other person, dude, is firing on all cylinders. Maybe Corey Stoll is a little loose, all right, as, as kind of a local police officer, but even he's pretty good. Everybody else is killing it. They're killing it, man. They're so good. And I think it's because all of these people are theater actors, right? Like they've all done, they've all done a little bit of film, but for the most part, like these are people who have already won Tonys. Rachel Ziegler, Ziegler, sorry, has done a ton. She's played Maria a ton on 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 stage, but never on screen. So bringing all of these people who are so baked into the DNA of West Side Story in to celebrate this feature with Steven Spielberg, a blockbuster director. I mean, it's it's like a greatest hits of like up and coming actors and actresses. They are. Great, except for maybe Ansel Elgort. Andy, thoughts? Yeah, he's a little weak in in the role. Like he's he's a fine singer. He's a great singer, actually. Um, and it's you know you look at the track list. He's singing on all these things, and it's it's a really kind of high tenor part 
really challenging part but he's just so bland like i was like why is she in love with him he's so like just <laughs> basic and uninteresting right. uh and so he's he's fine but he's not like you know and he's got some act, good acting scenes and they're like fine is what i i would describe but when you're fine and everyone else is incredible you look bad yeah that's that's true like when when everybody else is just killing it and you're all right then it comes up bad especially when you're the lead right like you don't want to be one of the leads in the, in in the, in the film and and just not not quite there spielberg says in interviews he was good I mean, it's Spielberg's direction, like Spielberg seemed to like what he was doing. Uh, he's light on his feet. He can sing, but it's 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 the in-between stuff. It's in-between the songs. Like, that's where he's weak. Um, I don't know. Different strokes, different folks. People feel differently about it. The music uh, is fantastic. Like Andy said, the, the full orchestral score is really great. And additionally, uh, the dance numbers are the best parts of the film, hands down. They are, in my opinion, hypnotizing. I could not look away from the screen really really great stuff especially uh, if you're watching us on facebook you can see the screenshot we've got up from uh living in america the song is it living in america this is america it's just america america uh arguably the best dance number really 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 great stuff and, and featuring two characters who basically have been set up in the film up to that point to be rivals of our main characters right from the other gang and it goes to show how much fun like everybody is in this production not not only like are these characters who up to that point we haven't really come to love they're a bit of the enemy um but it, it just it brings out the best parts of them and and it shows how multifaceted all of these people are in in west side story it really brings out the best parts of the film yeah um it like i said the the dance number the song and dance stuff is so good the uh the the big um kind of not school school dance but uh kind of town hall dance uh party that that they go to at, at the end of the first act uh is another really solid number and that's where a lot of the classic songs are as well america the the rumble the um uh the one's called cool when 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 it's uh, when he gets the gun uh yeah, yeah. Re really solid stuff like the the music is just so uh it's so top top notch it really is and i've been i've been playing the soundtrack uh you know since i watched it yeah I, I And like I said, this is Spielberg's first musical. He's never done one before. Um, so those moments, I think I think the dancing, the singing, like the, the most bombastic parts of the film, that stuff works really well. But the quieter parts, the slower parts, um, I found myself bored. It's a long film, uh, two hours, 36 minutes. So you're in for the long haul when you go see West Side Story. It's so long, there, there is a noticeable bit of intermission in there uh, where the intermission is in the original, in the original work. Uh, Camp... It fades to black, fades back up. I sorely wish they had kept an intermission. Wouldn't have minded ten. Wouldn't have minded a ten minute break to go refill my popcorn. But uh, you know, not not too shabby. Maybe something best consumed at home for exactly that reason. Do you think it was too long? Am I am I barking up the wrong tree? What do you think? It, I didn't think it was too long because I don't I don't know what parts you cut uh, because there's so much. Um, everything is is so good, but it's also yeah. It it just it is long. I definitely. Um, I definitely at, at one point, one of the weaker songs, I'm like, I'm going to get up and use the restroom right now. This is this is the song to go and do it. I did get up during a song and go go to the bathroom. I wonder if it's the same one you did. I got up and went to the bathroom during I Feel Pretty. No, mine was before that was mine was at uh, the when they're in the police station, like in the middle. Officer of the Krupke? Oh, that one was fun. I'll, uh, I Feel Pretty was probably fun, too. I, I, I missed it. So, you know, what are you going to do? Um, yeah, I, I, that, like go ahead well what that does uh bring up something that i did want to point out that there is uh definitely some uh support for the trans community in this uh in this movie there's someone that who's on the jets that um i think is clearly meant to be a trans character um and that that has an important very visible role because a lot of times you know there's a lot of lip service paid to like these different kind of communities uh for instance in the, there was a star wars thing where there's like uh, a same-sex female couple and it, but there, it's like in the background off to the side out of focus so you don't really you know yeah uh so i the you know they did a, they were very intentional in the use of, of this this character uh and that, that really stood out to me sorry uh in the background off to the side out of focus killed me which <laughs> <laughs> is exactly how dizzy did it in star wars yeah they're like there's a there's a there's a kiss in this movie and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. And like, yeah, it's so in the background, you wouldn't even notice if there wasn't an article about it. So 
what are you gonna do uh yeah there there is a trans character in this film which was surprising i i told christine driving home from watching it i said i don't know what that means because i know spielberg isn't exactly woke um i don't i don't know what he intended for that character to be in this film but it's there and it's important and i'm glad i think i think that's good for representation good for diversity and this and this film covers that uh in spades i i mean there, this story of two different groups of individuals who are both down on their luck and downtrodden and trying to survive in a bombed out slum of what's left of the upper west side of new york is is i guess the lower west side of new york is is it's tough to watch um and spielberg manages to capture those landscapes great i mean it looks like they're in a war zone in some of these scenes they're filming when they end up actually having the the, the rumble towards the end of the film um they're in this wonderful like salt shed it, it looks awesome like and and spielberg on occasion goes out of his way to, to, to put one too many lights in the frame and do like the lens flare thing that he got from working with jj abrams whatever all right like he can he can lens flare all he wants i guess but i did feel like outside of those musical numbers yeah, i just felt a little dry and, and it, it i don't know if you feel that way so a, a little bit and that's mostly that has to do with the fact that it's a Romeo and Juliet story. And one of the things that is kind of just weak about those is that you have to believe that the characters fall in love, like kind of instantly. And it's a little bit hard to swallow. It's not super be believable. That's probably, but that's not a fault of the film. It's just a fault of the Romeo and Juliet uh, narrative, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know where that comes from. I, I uh, sorry, I had some weird audio issues on my end, but I think they've resolved themselves now. Um, yeah, it very much is a Romeo and Juliet kind of narrative, um, almost to a fault. I, I, like I said, I, I didn't, I didn't need Steven Spielberg to reinvent the wheel. I didn't need him to uh, tear down West Side Story and build it into something new. But it just, it, it plays so so safe like with the original work it's so within the lines with you know of the uh it never it never really feels like it, it pushes an edge anywhere the only spot it felt like this movie really started to break out and do something different was shifting one of the gangs from uh i think cuban in the original work to irish in this but even then like that's not that much of a change fundamentally um and it's still like is ultimately depicting two like disparaged communities in the uh 1940s 1950s like in the same part of new york like it, it is the same like uh, of what you've seen just with a fresh coat of paint and i guess that's not bad um for fans of west side story but but for me looking for something you know re really bombastic on the screen um i, le I left i left disappointed because i was overhyped i think right um mm -hmm. And well, and, and Spielberg talked about uh, modern, or he was, I he was asked about modernizing if if he was interested in that at all, and he was he said absolutely not. He wanted to it's a story from the fifties, and it's it kind of needs to stay there, especially because a lot of the you know part part of the tension is you know it, it's racial tension be between the, these the white Irish gangs and the the Puerto Rican gangs, and like that's acceptable to swallow in the fifties. If you do that now, then it's like it, it's a really bad like political look um so you know he he wanted to keep it there yeah and uh you know i, I mission accomplished i guess like he he, he had a vision and he, he chased it uh to to what i felt like was not the direction i was hoping as an audience member but it, you know this isn't made for spielberg fans this is made for west side story fans and i think that's an important distinction to make so i don't know if i have much more to say about it any any other thoughts andy for recommendations I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend Steven Spielberg's West Side Story? Oh, absolutely. I, I think it is a triumph uh, of a remake. It's it's an it's an incredible musical in in itself. It's it's a one of these probably very famous like pieces of of American work. Um, and if if you don't like musicals, this is probably the one to start with, uh, or at least one one of the ones to start with uh, to just see what they're all about. Great singing, great dancing, great acting. Everyone in here is probably going to get nominated. Um, at, at least Ariana DuBose and uh, who's the guy that plays uh, Riff? Uh, Mike Faced uh, as well. Um, Riff is the great. The, yeah. The, yeah, the cast is 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 phenomenal, and I, I I wouldn't be surprised if like when the Oscars air, they'll probably do a you know they'll probably sing and dance on stage as well. So I, I really enjoyed it. Um, just remember, it is a little long, so just you know block out your whole afternoon because it's gonna. <laughs> I had like twenty minutes of uh, yeah. previews as well, so it was uh, pretty much the whole 
whole afternoon. But yeah, re- really liked it. Really high, highly recommend. I, I wish it probably should have also been available to stream as well. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not quite in that camp. I, I think it's worth waiting for streaming. Um, I like I said, I like musicals a lot, but like if you've seen the original West Side Story, like there is not a lot new happening. It is it is a really refreshing coat of paint. But it's the same house. Like you're you're looking at the same story, like with beats and and um, just a lot of the stuff that are already makes West Side Story great, which is fantastic. Um, because of the length, I think it's worth waiting for streaming. I know like 33 percent of its box office take in opening IMAX, like it is showing on big screens. If you want to go big and see it bombastic, take advantage of the silver screen and go see it when you can. Ah. I think yeah, you could watch it at home and take advantage of that intermission and kind of kind of pace it out yourself. Like maybe that's the best way to go, right? Ultimately, live theater is about pacing, and this film has an awful lot of it. That's West Side Story. I, I, I'm sorry, I feel like my my review is a little disjointed. I'm still working through how I feel about it. It, it is a very good movie. Um, it just wasn't the movie I expected. And with that, we should move on to our next segment. Uh, we are going to be talking about. The Death of Cinema, and specifically WGA's 101 Greatest Screenplays of the 21st Century so far. We are not going to go over all 101 of these. That's insane. <laughs> but Andy found this and showed it to me, and I thought, okay, you know, this actually is pretty rad. Andy, well, what's the best place to start here? Top 10? I mean, you want to just go through and pick some favorites? What do you think? Well, uh, it, it's an interesting list, and, and of course, remember, these things are highly, highly subjective, but um, it's interesting to see what made the list, and what's at the very top of the headline was that Jordan Peele's Get Out was number one, at the very top, top of, the, of the list, and that is a really great film, and it takes a very complex and nuanced uh, look at, at, at race and racism, and it's also, it's, it's, it also works on like a horror front um but there's a lot of great films on here i've seen i think most of these uh christopher nolan is on here several times um well let, let's just look at this top 10 so the top 10 was get out uh eternal sunshine of the spotless mind uh which this is, is this is in ascending order so number one get out number two eternal sunshine of the spotless right. mind go ahead uh, the Social Network, which is uh, by Aaron Sorkin, Parasite by Bong Joon Ho, No Country for Old Men uh, by the Coen Brothers, Moonlight by Barry Jenkins, There Will Be Blood by Paul Thomas Anderson, Glorious Bastards by uh, Tarantino, Almost Famous. Uh, that's that was actually kind of a surprise to be this high up. Uh, written by Cameron Crowe, uh, Memento uh, rounds out the number ten um, by by Chris Nolan, and then and then a ton of of great films. Uh, if, if you've been you know, if you're at all into films, you've probably seen uh, the majority of these uh, as I have. Yeah, I, uh, I I was definitely 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 ashamed when when Andy showed this to me and said, "Just roll through starting at one and see how see how long you go till there's a movie you haven't seen." I get to nine because I never saw <laughs> Almost Famous uh, from Cameron Crowe. Um, but there are a ton of really really fantastic works on here. Some that surprise me. I mean, things like Michael Clayton at, at, at number twenty. If you remember the that uh, is surprising, yeah. Yeah, if you if you remember the George Clooney film, uh, you know it's, it's good but forgettable. Right. Additionally, you know, seeing creators that we are familiar with, uh, Wes Anderson, Christopher Nolan, and here Taika Waititi, like seeing them land multiple spots is really exciting as well because it shows just how and just how on it these folks are. I, I hope this is a list that will persevere. Obviously, the 21st century is pretty long. We're only 21 years into it, so we got a ways to go. But um, there's some, there's there's some good stuff on here man yeah, and I, I, I yeah this is a good list but one thing that it's that uh really stands out or that i would like to see the percentage of um not only people of color writers but also female writers uh as well because i it skews heavily heavily male a lot of men in here yeah that's true um and it's and again this is why uh we got to be careful because even though like the headline was jordan peele is is number one he's at the top and that's great but that doesn't mean there's balance in the uh you know there isn't we have not reached equality just because a black guy is at the the top a lot of times that that perception can be used to to justify that's like well there well, there's 98 percent white white people white men so um, right it's it's certainly promising to see it so high up especially considering you know why get out screenplay works on such a fundamental level embracing 
you know, an, an ideology like racism and using it as an element of horror is modern and 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 postmodern maybe and and avant garde and and it's just smart in a way that I think people weren't super familiar with. It's exciting to see it at the top, but you're right, long way to go. Like that's 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 a great start. That's that that shows progress yeah. and growth. But also, yeah. it, it, these are pretty. You know, these are all mostly American films. Uh, not a lot of uh, international films uh, considered. It, it doesn't look like either. Yeah, glad that's, to see, that's, glad, that's also yeah, true. Yeah, glad to see Parasite up there. Hey, number four, man, Parasite holding the town. And then, yeah, as you scroll, you start to get some older stuff. And you're like, okay, I, I, I've seen all these. Lots of Pixar, but a Disney in here. Um, really fantastic work. Uh, you can find the whole list at WGAEast.org for the Writers Guild of America, East. Uh, and I would say go take a gander. You might be surprised where you find some of your favorites. I thought uh, a couple I really loved would be higher, and then I found some down towards the bottom that I was really impressed by. I thought, wow, mm -hmm. I never thought this would have made it on here. So I was going to say, so based on my own, uh, you know, criteria of scroll until till you see something you haven't seen, I got to thirty nine, which is before sunset. Which is the I have not seen any of those films. Actually, I haven't seen any of the before Me trilogy of you. No. <laughs> yeah I, yeah I god i always hear amazing if you know tell you what if we need to, if we need to take a gander at those right into the show mail at offscript film review.com let us know well, well look you you write in the show and tell us to watch those movies I'll, I'll take a look i'll watch the first one see what it's about um anyway with that we should jump into our final film of the episode we'll be taking the summary on this one i'm gonna be honest i don't mean to put the cart before the horse here but I got a bit of a headache and I am probably not going to be as on with this review as I'd like. So let's just jump into it. The movie is The Harder They Fall. So The Harder They Fall is a Netflix Western that is available now on the service, directed by James Samuel and features a really, really stellar cast. Uh, the Harder They Fall is a uh, historical fiction, I think, is, is, is the proper term for it. It's a look at you know, I'm going to be honest, I don't, I don't even remember the name of the town, but I can give you the quick summary. Uh, when Nat Love discovers that his enemy, Rufus Buck, a, a, a notorious gang leader, is alive and has escaped prison and is on the prowl once again with the Rufus Buck gang, he rallies his own gang of troops, the Nat Love gang, to go face off uh, in Red Rock, I believe is the name of the town, uh, for one big rumble face off to determine who's the biggest gang of them all. Uh, there's some injustice, backstabbing, there's some hijinks, there's some betrayal. And like I said, there's an incredible cast led by Jonathan Majors, uh, Zazie Beetz, Regina King, Lakeith Stanfield, and Idris Elba as Rufus Buck, the notorious gang leader. That's just to name a few. I was so surprised by this movie. I feel like I so often watch a Netflix film and roll my eyes because I think it's going to be cool and ultimately it isn't. The Harder They Fall is something different. Andy, what did you think of The Harder They Fall? I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would because I'm, I'm, I've am i reached a point where I'm pretty skeptical when anything comes out on Netflix because they have such a kind of mediocre track record. Like most of their stuff is not terrible, but it's not great either. Um, and it was also, it's kind of long, it's about two and a half hours. So I, I just didn't know uh, what to think. This movie, but this movie has a ton of style it, it it's very Tarantino-esque in it. And it's, you know, there's a lot of slow walking with music pumping and people looking cool and like guns and cigarettes and uh, all this. And, you know, it's a, it's a story of, of generations uh, of betrayal, of love, of, of justice, all, all these things, these, these kind of rival gangs. And, and it's uh, kind of what we, we were saying is historical fiction. These it uses a lot of real life people, or people that were active in in the in the West, um, in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds, and puts them in this fictional uh, story. Uh, the one thing is that it it has a lot of really great individual scenes, but it's like I said, it's it feels a little bit too long. That's probably my only uh, real gripe about it. But it's 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 a lot of fun. Yeah, it, the harder they fall has a unique. A unique script. The angle is great, right? One gang versus the other. You got star-studded cast on each on each side of the of the fence, right? Both both gangs have a bunch of really cool people in them that you're rooting for. Um, I do think it has to juggle a few too many characters, and that does make it feel like it's like the like the pacing's off. Um, and I don't mind that, but you do you do feel like as you're coming towards like the third act when you're gonna come up on this like kind of rumble, you're like, man, half these people are probably gonna eat it, right? Like it's the old <laughs> West. That's how it works. And 
you know, you're going to have to watch it and find out what happens that way. No spoilers here on off script, but um, I was so impressed by the cinematography, the lighting, the set design, the costuming, the casting, the acting, the general direction, like really, really creative work here. I mean, fast camera angles, crash zooms. You're right. Like almost Tarantino esque gorilla style filmmaking. It reminds me of sorry to bother you. The boots Riley feature. Like it reminds me of, Oh gosh. Uh, end of watch that, that Jake Gyllenhaal movie where he's a cop and they mounted a GoPro on the end of a shotgun when he's raiding a house, like little stuff like that, little creative endeavors to, 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 to action filmmaking that really dress up and, and give us something new. Uh, to something we've already seen before. We should jump into our cast. Uh, I, Andy, you want, I feel like I've been talking a minute. You want to dig into these folks or should I just start going? Yeah. The list? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hue. It's a hoot hue. It's a who's who of, of up and coming and established uh, black actors. Um, but, you start off with the list. Yeah, let, me, um, let me just hear. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna start. I'm, I'm not gonna give any names. I'm just gonna start rolling down IMDb. Jonathan Majors, Eddie Gaffigy, Damon Wayans Jr., R.J. Kyler, Daniel Deadweiler, Tori B. Lawrence, Zazie Beetz, Regina King, Keith Stanfield, Delroy Lindo, Idris Elba, Mark Rhino Smith, Dion Cole, Terrence Clout. Like, <laughs> and what's crazy is a lot of these names. I didn't recognize at first shine, but then I'm watching the film. I'd, I'd say, Oh yeah, I saw him in something else. Oh, I saw her in this. Like, and it, it really starts to pull together, like just the talent of how many good people are in this film under director, James Samuel, who previously has not done anything I've really seen. I like, I, I, so this is his, this is his first really big feature. So this is something there's some, there's some magic happening here. It's, it's, it's really surprising how good this movie is. Yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, Regina King wasn't really interested in this, and uh, the director James Samuel really sold sold uh, her on it. And uh, she said in an interview, like you know, he can sell anything to any anyone. Like he he really got this cast uh, together for this film, got them really excited. Um, and and she's excellent as as well. But yeah, it, it's just it's a fun movie. It's it's got so much style. You know, it's. It's got the old West. You got shootouts. You got action. You got train robberies. You know the the works. Yeah, I I, I do want to take a moment to talk about the set design and costuming. I, I know I mentioned it earlier, but the, the town of Red Rock, this little town, feels so tangible. It's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> All these buildings are like beautifully painted. Like the, the trim and the colors are like multifaceted. These deep jewel tones of blues and reds and greens and purples and yellows. Like it really makes this town light up on screen. And it's a step away from what we've seen in traditional Westerns, right? Similar to our cast. Like it's something different and something exciting and something new, but within the rules of a Western that we know, right? Duels and shootouts and honor and running from the cops and riding away into the sunset on your horse. Like all of those traditional tropes placed into an exciting new canvas that is chock full of color. Again, like coming from a young director, I wouldn't think this would work. Going straight to Netflix, I wouldn't think this would work. I was wrong. This movie's cool. Um, and I'm impressed like by how well that all comes together because it just seems like there's so much going against it. And just like Boots Riley's Sorry to Bother You, like sometimes when you go see a feature from a up and coming artist uh, who is shifting into the director chair. Like you might be surprised at how awesome it is. Um, really fantastic work in here. I'll yeah. talk about costuming. I, sorry. I, I, I did say I was going to say something about that. If you're watching on Facebook live, you can see our uh, quick screenshot I've got here. There's just a few of the Cowboys in our feature playing, played by Jonathan majors, Delroy Lindo. And what is his name? I'll remember soon. Uh, really really good fits everybody looks good in this movie like everybody looks awesome even 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 idris elba in prison stripes looks awesome in this movie and i love that like i love that everybody looks confident feels calm acts like a spicy cowboy and then it's it's awesome <laughs> it really gives a tone and a feel and a mood to the movie it just makes it feel hard it's great right the uh 
the only thing that that I think the main criticism I have is just it's it's a little long. It, it's a full two and a half hours, and every sequence is pre, is pretty well. It's pretty great. It's it's you know you, you have like this meeting of Jonathan Majors and and his love interest. That that's a whole thing. You have this uh, breaking uh, Rufus Buck out of this train prison uh, that's guarded by Union soldiers. You know, you have a lot of really interesting set pieces, but there's just too many of them. There's several times where I'm like, you could probably cut this, and you could probably cut that, and chop like 20 minutes off off this film yeah i agree uh the pacing is a bit of a problem and i think it's just because they've got a full plate like it's just a lot of people to deal with uh, i know james samuel helped write the screenplay along with boaz yakin i think it's his name boaz yakin i'm not sure i i apologize um but it's no no good there we go. Hey, we're still on. Man, StreamYard is struggling today. So we better wrap up things while we're at it. Andy, any other thoughts for recommendations? Uh, no, I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend Netflix's The Harder They Fall? Yeah, I would. It, it's a lot of fun. Again, it's on Netflix. So if you're already subscribed, it's there for you. This actually came out about a month ago or so. And I think it had a very brief theatrical run. There could be some Oscar campaigns going on for it. But it's fun. It's entertaining. It's, it's got a lot of style. Again, it's got it's got that uh, kind of Django Unchained, um, Quentin Tarantino feel to a lot of it. It's a who's who who cast uh, of black actors. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's just a little bit too long. Uh, but I would still recommend. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Uh, this movie's a ton of fun. It's not every day that a movie comes straight to Netflix um, from an original director. And it's like a ringing endorsement. Um, but that's what this one is. Um, I was surprised. I hope you are surprised too when you tune in and watch The Harder They Fall. I agree, a little long, but it's okay. You're watching it at home. You can take your time. You can stay, pause it and go use the restroom if you need to, whatever. Uh, enjoy this movie. It's something fresh. It's something new. I'm excited to see what James Samuel does next. And with that, we should wrap our show. Uh, Andy, what are we watching next week? Well, next week, actually, in just two days, uh, we are going to be seeing Spider-Man: No Way Home, which is mm. going to, which is uh, the latest from Marvel. This will be a theatrical exclusive. We got our hot tickets uh, ready for Thursday night premiere. Uh, so that's that's going to it be a long one. It's the finale to uh, this trilogy, uh, at least uh, for now. We'll see. Uh, Tom Holland is signed on to do more Spider-Man movies, so uh, we'll see where that goes. But that's the big release to, uh, for this week. Uh, Nightmare Alley also comes out. Uh, but our second film, we might just do one second film to be decided if we do one. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Andy was so on it. Y'all should y'all should y'all should be lucky to have a friend like Andy in your lives. I uh, bought bought tickets early for like six seats Thursday night. Excited to go check it out. Uh, hopefully before spoilers make it out onto the internet, God willing. Uh, so y'all should go see it early too. And then yeah, if we watch it and it feels a little thin, we may talk about something else. But typically for long comic book features like. Uh, the Infinity larger War, Avengers yeah. films, yeah, like we typically just dedicate one whole episode to it, so we'll we'll feel it out. We'll, we'll go check it out Thursday and see how it feels. Otherwise, plan on being here next Tuesday for Spider Man No Way Home, and uh, you know that's God, it's just about our show. Uh, thanks for listening. If you stuck around all the way to the end, uh, if you liked what we're doing here, if you want to find out more, you can follow us on Facebook, you can follow us on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, where we post our live streams. Of course, we stream our show usually every Tuesday at about 4.30 when I'm not moving. Uh, so thanks again for sticking around through the hiatus. Uh, we are online at offscriptfilmreview.com. You can mail us correspondence, mail at offscriptfilmreview.com. But the biggest thing you can do to support the show, if you want to help us out, maybe like what you heard and want to hear more, you can just subscribe. Just subscribe to the show and your favorite podcast outlet, right? iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartMedia, wherever you're at, we're there. And uh, maybe leave a rating and review while you're at it. So drop those five stars. Tell us what you thought. A couple lines. We'd, uh, we'd appreciate it. You have no idea how much it helps us podcasting. That's just a big deal. With that being said, uh, from all of us at Offscript, the home of Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.